In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O God of earth and altar, bow down and hear our cry. Our earthly rulers falter, our people drift and die. The walls of gold entomb us, the swords of scorn divide. Take not thy thunder from us, but take away our pride. From all the terror teaches, from lies of tongue and pen, from all the easy speeches that comfort cruel men, from sale and profanation of honor and the sword, from sleep and from damnation, deliver us, good Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The last conference on the Holy Hour suggested a break in the routine of priestly life, and it really will mark the difference between just being an ordinary priest and a very saintly priest. As Shakespeare put it in his Julius Caesar, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omit it, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we afloat, and we must take the current when it seems or lose the venture. And because it represents the holy hour, a tremendous break. I'm going to talk about that in terms of our greatness and our littleness. St. Paul, in the letter to the Corinthians, describes us well. He said, we are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this treasure. We're pots, earthen pots, containing a treasure. And there are at times when we priests concentrate perhaps on the pot and begin to despair. Then when we think about the treasure we have, we're full of hope. And I'm going to carry through this analogy of the pot and its treasure and how the pot is enriched. But let me finish this passage of St. Paul and notice the beauty of this translation of the New English Bible. We are no better than pots of earthenware to contain this treasure, and this power proves that such transcendent power does not come from us, but is God's alone. Hard pressed on every side, we are never hemmed in. Bewildered, we are never at our wit's end. Hunted, we are never abandoned to our fate. Struck down, we are not left to die. Wherever we go, we carry death with us in our body. The death that Jesus died. That in this body also life might reveal itself the life that Jesus lives. For continually, while still alive, we are being surrendered into the hands of death. In other words, this poor pot of ours takes a licking every now and then. But we can never lose sight of the fact that this is the message of the cross, this disciplining, Remember the Greeks came to our blessed Lord on one occasion shortly before his death, just about a week before. We do not know what they asked our Lord, but I think we can guess it from the answer that our Lord gave. I think the Greeks said to our Lord, 
If you stay here in this land and with this people, you will suffer death. Why not leave here? Come to Athens. We have never killed any of our wise men except Socrates, and we've regretted ever since that we gave him that hemlock juice. They must have said that because our Lord gave them an answer not from Isaiah but from nature. Unless the seed fall into the ground die, it remaineth alone, but if it die, it springs forth to life. So our pot is subject to a discipline and a kind of crucifixion, and we will follow the earthenware pot of our human nature through the scriptures. What is the condition of enriching the treasure? Emptiness. De-egotization. Eccentration. The great battle the church has to fight today, particularly with us priests and sisters, is the affirmation of the self. And that stands in the way of God ever using us as an instrument. Look at the way, for example, the prophet handled the good woman who was suffering from considerable poverty. The wife of a member of the company of prophets appealed to Elisha. My husband, your servant, has died, she said, and you know what a man he was. And He feared the Lord, but a creditor has come to take my two boys and his slaves. Elisha said to her, how can I help you? Tell me what you have in the house. Nothing at all, she said, except a flask of oil. Go out then, he said, and borrow vessels and pots from all your neighbors. Get as many empty ones as you can. Then when you come home, shut yourself in with your sons. And pour from the flask into these vessels. And as they are filled, set them aside. She left him and shut herself in with her sons. And they brought her the pots. She filled them. And when they were all full, she said to one of her sons, Bring me another pot. There is not one left, he said, and the flow of the oil ceased. Why is it that some of us have more of Christ than others? It's because Christ cannot get in. The more empty we are, the more he can fill us. And this emptiness, of course, is related to evangelical councils. And apropos of those today, as you have noticed, poverty is in. Chastity and obedience are out. Everyone today loves poverty, particularly for someone else. But the emptying demands the practice of all three evangelical councils. And now what does God intend to do with us as pots? Does he have a plan for us? As a matter of fact, God has perhaps a more perfect plan than we have ever realized. God has two images of each and every one of us, the one he wants us to be and the one we are. In the case of the Blessed Mother, there's only one image. She fulfilled the dream. She was really a dream walking. And as regards the making of the pots, we now come to the prophet Jeremiah. These are the words which came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the potter's house 
and there I will tell you what I have to say. So I went down to the potter's house and found him working at the wheel. Now and then a vessel he was making out of the clay would be spoilt in his hands. And then he would start again and mold it into another vessel to his liking. And then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not deal with you, Israel, says the Lord, as the potter deals with the clay? What the potter intended to do was to make a Meng vase. If it's expensive, it's a vase. If it's cheap, it's a vase. So here is the potter with the clay and the wheel, and he intends to make the best. And the clay somehow or other hardens perhaps too rapidly or doesn't harden sufficiently, and it falls down from the wheel. Does the potter neglect the clay? No, he picks it up and he molds it into another vessel. The vase becomes a vase. God does not abandon us poor pots. He picks us up and makes us well to his liking, whatever it happens to be. But we are not abandoned, but he does have an ideal, just the same. Now what is in the pot of ours, of course, is grace. And here we come to a lesson that God teaches us concerning our treasure. We turn here to the prophet Jeremiah in the 48th verse. All his life long, Moab has lain undisturbed like wine settled on its lees, not emptied from vessel to vessel. He has not gone into exile, therefore the taste of him is unaltered and the flavor stays unchanged. Jeremiah is here describing the way that the Jews made wine. They would pour the grape wine into a vessel, allow it to settle. And when the lees began to form, then the wine would be poured into another vessel. And then after the dregs had settled there, it would be poured into still another and still another and another until there was perfect wine. And God says here of Moab, the people that allowed the Israelites did not allow them to pass through their land. Moab has settled on its lees. It never went into exile. There was no pouring out of a vessel, no change, no taking on of a new challenge. And for that reason, it lost its taste. This is the reason we have suggested the hour, so that we'll not settle on our leaves. The rest of our life we'll consider as dregs. Now we'll begin to be poured from vessel to vessel in order to be enriched with grace. And this is what our blessed Lord under another simile took up when he was talking to his apostles the night of the Last Supper. He said, I am the real vine and my father is the gardener. And every barren branch of mine he cuts away. And every fruiting branch he cleans to make it more fruitful still. So the heavenly father purges us. The figure is changed now from the leaves to the vine. A discipline, a trial a handicap, a cross, 
something comes into our life. And why is the pruning done? He said to make us more fruitful. And that's why we've asked for this change, for more fruit. Our vines have to be pruned. And we'll be surprised at the richness of the harvest. And then, summing it up, we come to the epistle to the Hebrews, where St. Paul says, you must endure it as discipline. This is the one thing that has passed out of our life, discipline, self-sacrifice. Now notice how what we become if we have not discipline. You must endure it as discipline. God is treating you as sons. Can anyone be a son who is not disciplined by his father? If you escape the discipline in which all sons must share, you are bastards and not true sons. We pay due respect to earthly fathers who disciplined us, should we not submit even more readily to our spiritual father and so attain life. Come then, stiffen your drooping arms and shaking knees, and keep your steps from wavering, and then the disabled limb will not be put out of joint, but regain its former powers. However you use the analogy, it makes little difference whether it be changing from vessel to vessel so that we do not settle on our lees, whether it be an emptying of ourselves in order that we might be filled, for God's grace stops when we are filled, or whether it be discipline so that we do not become bastards. The cross has to be introduced into our lives. And if we take on the discipline ourselves, the hour. The Lord will not have to empty the vessel so that there be no lees or dregs. And when we have done this to ourselves, then we'll be prepared to change others. It is when a spiritual life of a priest is transformed that he becomes effective in transforming other lives. Why is it that conversions have stopped in the church? It's because we're not just enthusiastic about being the ambassadors of Christ and the priests of the Heavenly Father, anxious to make sons and daughters for himself. And if we were fully engaged in this life of Christ, we would be constantly looking about for souls. St. James tells us that if we save a soul, we will not lose our own. The potential of conversion now in the church is just as great as ever. But they're not coming to us principally because they're not inspired by us. As Nietzsche said, there are not many good things that one can quote from Nietzsche. But Nietzsche said, if you do not act like a man redeemed, how can you get me to believe in a redeemer? And the souls are very often at our doorsteps. I remember in a church where I worked in all about seven or eight years of my life, church in London, I opened up the church door, epiphany morning, a cold, heavy London fog, and a limp figure fell in the door. A young woman about 25, 26 years of age, 
And I said, what are you doing here? She said, where am I, Father? And I said, Father, yes. She said, I used to be a Catholic, but not anymore. Were you drunk? Yes. I said, men drink because they like the stuff. Women drink because they don't like something else. What were you running away from? She said, from three men. And I was involved with all three, and they were beginning to find it out. So I got drunk. What is your name? And pointing to a billboard across the street on the wall of the Cross and Blackwell Jam office, I said, is that your picture over there? Yes, she said, I'm leading lady in that musical comedy. Being very cold from exposure to the London fog, I made a cup of coffee for her. She said, thanks, and I said, no. Come back this afternoon and thank me. She said, I will on one condition, that you do not ask me to go to confession. I said, I promise you faithfully not to ask you to go to confession. She said, I want you to promise me again that you will not ask me to go to confession. I said, I promise you faithfully not to ask you to go to confession. She came back that afternoon before matinee. I said, we have a Rembrandt and a Van Dyke painting in this church. Would you like to see them? And as we walked down the middle aisle, I pushed her into a confessional. I did not ask her to go. And then three months later, I gave her her veil as a nun in the convent of perpetual adoration where she is to this very hour. And thus, the wine did not remain so long in the pot that it was spoiled by the lees. The point I'm trying to make, therefore, is in relationship to our own life and the relationship to others, we have to change them with discipline. The young are not beyond us. The young are not impressed by what we say. There's only one authority today that is accepted. It is the authority of service. Only the discipline today can command. And when others see our lives different than the rest of men, then they will come to us. Because the instinct of the people of our faithful is infallible. As the instinct of the priesthood is infallible. If, for example, in a diocese, the priesthood generally agrees that this particular man is a kook, he is a kook. If only one or two say he's a kook, he isn't. And so with the faithful. The faithful know us. And the number of confessions, penitents that come to us, is an indication of the way they read us. They found that this pot of ours is full of spiritual treasure. And then we'll be able, because we have been disciplined and have enriched the treasure, we'll be able to console the suffering. So many people have said, I can find a priest who can talk only two or three minutes on suffering. Here's a letter that I got from someone in an iron lung. This morning I was thinking about you and the young men at such and such a college in Washington, D.C. A number of them to be ordained in June. While there I had an opportunity to talk quite a bit with them and what I heard made me deeply sad. I asked them if they believed a priest should be a victim 
as well as one who offers sacrifice. They looked at each other with blank expressions and answered, No. I told them if they were serious about personal holiness, God would begin to purge them and purify them. And they smiled at me sweetly, not wanting to be rude, but it was very plain that they thought I was some relic of another age. One man said that he really didn't think that his vocation was any different from that of any other Christian. What are people like me going to do in decades to come if they have no priest to tell them the infinite value of suffering? They will be doomed to spend their lives in despair and bitterness. And we will learn the lesson of suffering by the disciplining of ourselves in this hour and meditating about the passion of Christ, we will understand suffering because we're in that hour. This particular woman who wrote this letter, I met, I was talking in a theater in, in Florida. It was rather a large theater of about 3,500. And in the dim light, I saw five or six wheelchairs below the stage. At the end of the lecture, I jumped down from the stage to talk to the people in wheelchairs. And over against the wall was something that someone that looked like a Greek statue. A woman in an iron lung, swathed in white, because no part of her body could move except her head. She said, I'm a convert of yours. I said, I've never seen you before. No, she said, it was from something you wrote. How long have you been in this iron lung? Twenty-one years. Do you understand suffering? She said, no. I said, I shall write to you every day for six months to try to give you some understanding of it. Well, that she got it is clear from the fact that she understood that every priest was a victim. I have not developed that aspect of the priesthood in this retreat because it is in the book. But we're not just priests. We're victims. Our Lord was not just a priest. He offered himself. That's what we do. And that is why the holy hour is meant to be the sign of our victimhood so that every day we can take out of time one hour and say, this will belong to the Lord. As a matter of fact, we don't have time for anything else until we've come near this Eucharistic fire. Sure, we've got to empty out pleasures to allow the oil to be poured in, the oil of the Spirit, then we'll not be settling on the dregs of our life. And we'll really begin to understand the person of Christ and how he summoned us. Poor pots that we are to carry this great treasure. If we have never sought thee, we seek thee now. Thine eyes burn through the dark, our only stars. We must have sight of thorn pricks on thy brow. We must have thee, O Jesus of the scars. The heavens frighten us. They are too calm. In all the universe we have no place. Our wounds are hurting us. Where is thy balm? Lord Jesus, by thy scars we claim thy grace. 
If when the doors are shut, thou drawest near, only reveal those hands, that side of thine. We know what wounds are. Have no fear. Show us thy scars. We know the countersign. The other gods were strong. But thou wast weak. They rode. But thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone.